it is madness that we continue to invest in building higher performance buildings, but then the benefits of those aren't achieved. The reality is it can be closed, and we have the knowledge and technology to do it, because it's going to be much more about organising ourselves in such a way that we actually design the entire buildings, down to the subsystems, and then ensure uh, they are built as designed, and if they're not, we have to go back and check that the design still works. But it's about designing the whole building, actually building it, and then we stand a chance of getting buildings to actually perform. But it is doable. The changes to Part L are about operational carbon, um, but increasingly that means the proportion of energy and carbon emissions will be associated with how the buildings are built and the materials they're built from. Um, so to me, this is the next key challenge, and that um, once we drive down operational energy to the lowest sort of practical levels, we'll then need to look at the other impacts. So that's transport, that's site impacts, but it's also about the manufacturing and sourcing the materials themselves. So very much on the agenda, plenty of scope for above regulatory standards and innovation, new business models, um, but also a role here for government to lead the way and establish a minimum requirement. I think it will happen this decade. Indeed, recently that was confirmed by the uh, Parliamentary Select Committee calling for embodied impacts and whole carbon life cycle assessment buildings to be incorporated into the 2025 uh, future home standard. Part O is an entirely new part of the building regulations. It has uh, massive implications to all the supply chains and how we use buildings. And of course, a lot of people think, why not just air condition if we're worried about our homes overheating? So it's a complex space, it's new, so everyone needs to look at it. Um, and it's acknowledging that there is an unintended consequence as we deal with the effects of climate change, as we improve the energy performance of our buildings, we need to be conscious that we are not making homes that, yes, are warm in summer, uh, sorry, warm in winter and uh, energy efficient, but are also um, don't overheat in summer. Um, from a regulatory point of view, and therefore part O of the building regulations, that's going to be from a health and safety perspective. There are going to be provisions to make sure homes don't get so hot they're dangerous. But then the next phase is then about comfort as well. So um, from a government point of view, it's about making sure people don't die and the risks are significant um, given climate change predictions. Air conditioning is a slightly different thing, which is about comfort cooling. So uh, even in a Part O compliant home, it still might get pretty warm. Uh, you might not be comfortable. Um, so I think there is a logic, actually, that certainly when we're looking at 2025 future home standard performing buildings, uh, energy demands are going to be so low that actually meeting the requirements for cooling and comfort cooling um, from using mechanical air conditioning becomes a possibility and in a way that is low carbon and energy efficient. But you have to get the fabric and we have to drive down the uh, summer overheating loads first. Otherwise, uh, there's a risk that air conditioning, if it's ad adopted on a large scale, will actually drive emissions up. So it's a, a, a tricky uh, tightrope from a regulatory and a industry point of view. Um, but importantly, it's just something that just everyone has to start paying attention to. Um, otherwise, uh, our homes will be too hot for some of our vulnerable, more vulnerable people in society.